Hello and welcome to the Xbox Perspective Ground Zero Episode 1. So this is a new branch off from the Gaming Perspective podcast. This is me and Sam and it could be Eric or it could be Jared or it could be someone else. So this would be basically a one-on-one show talking the latest Xbox news of the week. Of course, that involves everything from uh, Xbox to Windows 10 and all the stuff in between. So as always, I will introduce my co-host for the Ground Zero Phantom Pain episode of this podcast and that is mr samuel tolbert introduce yourself tell people where you're from etc cetera, etc cetera. nick i'm already a demon uh, <laughs> god damn it i knew i shouldn't have punished done sam a punished. podcast to rival the metal gear <laughs> does that mean i could go okay so for gaming perspective you shall refer to me as naked nick now <laughs> no 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 <laughs> you're either revolver nicholas or Ocelot Downey. Okay, I can we'll deal with either of those. I can deal we'll with either of those. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, dude? It's another week, man. It's another week. I right can here. talk again, so it's a, yeah, <laughs> it's a yeah. Good it's, it's good to see your jaw functioning again the way it's supposed to. Yeah, right. I'm here, and I can talk the amount of trash that I need to. It's a great feeling. Yeah. Um, exactly. Good so, to hear. Uh, thank you for bringing me along on this uh, inaugural trip, so to speak. Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, so to give people kind of an idea of what this show is kind of about, I'm not going to drone on about this too much. But so the basic perspective of this, yeah, I got to stop inserting perspective into all my words. It's built in now. Um, <laughs> branding. Um But basically, the point of Xbox perspective and PlayStation perspective is to talk about the latest news with PlayStation and Xbox and to give you guys the information without a spin on it, without uh, any form of, yeah, basically just spin on it. It's just presenting you guys with the information you need to know about the latest information. And then you guys can do what you want with that information and take it as you will. Uh, So for Xbox perspective, we're going to focus basically on things in the Xbox ecosystem, the games, um, the services, all the stuff in between, new games we're looking forward to, et cetera, et cetera. Just a bigger focus on specific platforms while Gaming Perspective will continue as a bi-weekly podcast. That is your go-to for all your multi-platform, whether it's PC, Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, OUYA, and everything in between. Um Platform. So this is kind of more to talk just about the state of Xbox and what we're seeing, what we're hearing, and everything else. So, as always, we're going to kick off with what we've been playing in the Xbox ecosystem, so to speak. So, Sam, have you been playing anything on Xbox the past week or two? I've actually been playing all the Gears of War games with RGP co-host Eric. Eric Jackson. He and I have been going through those. We're actually on Gears of War 4 right now. Just finished Act 2. I think we're actually going to try and hit hit up Act 3 later today. And I'm going to reiterate what I said back in 2016. This game didn't get a fair shake. Mm. It honestly didn't. I, I do not believe for one second. It is a way better game than a lot of people realize. I know it made a couple of mistakes. The Horde integration into campaign doesn't quite work as well as uh, I think the Coalition was hoping to. And for the majority of the story, up until about Act 5, it does play things safe. There's no real shocking swerves or anything like that. But for a game that was developed in under two years, the Coalition's first Gears of War game, I think it's fantastic. I thought it was a great new way to get back into the franchise. And uh, it's a great game. It's an absolutely fantastic game. So yeah, really enjoying going through that right now. Right on, yeah. Uh, I've been playing a mix mash of indies, um, dabbling in a little Minecraft, creating something for my daughter because she's been recently gotten into Minecraft. So, been doing a little bit of that. Going to dive into Gears Four, I think later this week. Uh, Want to get that all wrapped up before Gears Five comes up, so it's all fresh. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much been it in terms of what I've been playing on Xbox. There's a lot of stuff coming out in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, Blair Witch, um, I'm good looking forward to giving that a shot. Mammy Don, I've got pre-ordered on Xbox, and of course Gears 5, and then also Control. So there's like four games in two weeks. So it's going to get busy. Definitely going to get hectic. Um, 
So you brought up gears, which is good because we have a lot of gear stuff to go over. Like a lot. Um, it seems like for the past month, that's all we all all the stuff we've been coming out of Xbox lately has been gear stuff. We had the technical tests for two weeks. We had a bunch of gameplay showing off, um, and now we got a host of other stuff as well. So it was announced that Gears 5 has officially gone gold. Um, for those that don't know, I feel like this needs to be clarified because I saw a lot of people getting confused. Going gold means that the game is ready to print onto discs, essentially. So it, it means it can be released to manufacturing and then be distributed. This is not the same as in the music and entertainment industry of going gold, which means selling X number of copies. I saw some confusion around about that, so I figured I'd clarify that. So basically, going gold, Gears 5 has gone gold. It's ready to go. It's ready to ship. So a big step, uh, some small minor details that came out of the press release for uh, Gears 5 going gold is there's 71 achievements spanning campaign, escape versus horde, map builder, and more. And of course, uh, for those that are super hardcore, there is a seriously 5.0 achievement, which honestly just gives me my OCD just the worst, um, worst twinge ever. So Sam, any thoughts on Gears 5 going gold or even some thoughts on that achievement list? Uh, well, first off, congrats to the Coalition Splash Damage. I know this was a lot of work. This was a longer dev cycle. This was about three years, maybe just under three years by comparison. So much longer dev cycle. I'm really excited. They're saying it's the biggest Gears game they've ever made, that Rod realizes the mistakes they made with Gears of War 4. I'm I'm really excited. I've talked about this many a time before. Like, Despite having some misgivings with their marketing strategy so far, this franchise means quite a bit to me. It's very near and dear to my heart, and I'm really, really excited. I'm, I'm really excited to see just what they've got. Interestingly enough, there is one thing I want to highlight. No spoilers. This isn't spoiler or anything, but there's a lot of achievements for playing as Jack or for doing different things as Jack the robot. And I was under the impression that it was only the third player that played as Jack, but that's a lot of achievements to lock behind being the third player in a co-op campaign, if that's the case. So maybe in single player or just two player, you're going to be able to control him and give him orders, right? Because otherwise that it seems like a lot of those achievements would be very difficult to earn. I could be wrong. We'll find out. Uh, but, it, but it's interesting. It's it's just it's sticking out to me. It's sticking out to me. I, I I was thinking like personally, what I was thinking is maybe Jack's a rotational character. If you're playing by yourself, you can rotate and play as Jack, and then the AI will take over your character. That's that's possible. Maybe. That's one thing. Or maybe you can like give him orders, like you could like yeah. squad command sort of thing, so you can earn the achievements that way by like, hey Jack, cloak and stun this enemy, or hey Jack, grab that gun, or you know, you know things like that. I'm just spitballing. But yeah. it would make sense because otherwise that is a lot of achievements to lock behind being the third player. Uh, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I'm I don't know what else to say. I'm really excited. I've written uh, extensively about my time with the tech test. Uh, what little we've seen so far looks good. I guess that leads next right next into our subtopic, which is the Gamescom announcement. Yeah, uh, there's one thing I wanted to point out, and I think this was one of the uh, the best uh, subtle achievements, because as a lot of people know, some developers use achievements to not necessarily hide Easter eggs, but as tributes to certain things. And there's a the a five gamer score achievement for completing boot camp, which everyone's going to get. And the achievements name is my body is ready. Which, of mm -hmm. course, is a reference to Nintendo CEO Reggie for his absolute memeable phrase of my body is ready. And I thought that was a really cool sort of send off considering Reggie left uh, Nintendo earlier this year. It's a nice note. It's a nice note for him to leave on. That's Absolutely. Good. And uh, there, for, for those people that 100% Gears games, I've seen quite a few of you. Uh, on Twitter the past few, some people getting 100% of the achievements in Gears 4, which, by the way, if you do that, 100% congratulations to you. There are some really hard achievements in that. 
Um, yeah, no, I've spent hundreds of hours in that game, and there's plenty of achievements, plenty that I still don't have. There's some crazy ones in there. So Gears has, Gears has always been like that, though. Gears has always had a ton of achievements that it's it's insane to try and get them all. So one thing I wanted to point out that's going to be nerve wracking for our Gears 5 achievement hunters is so seriously 5.0 is called complete insane, insane campaign master horde and escape launch maps and characters get 20 reups and reach general in the tour of duty. The most nerve wracking part of this is it's the achievements actually called seriously 5.0 chapter one. Right, exactly. Like. <laughs> what on earth? I, now, to be fair, I do know that the coalition has said re-upping is going to be slightly easier and more balanced than it was in four. That they said it kind of got ridiculous towards the end there, how much experience you needed, and it's not going to be the, the, that case anymore. It's going to be much easier to re-up. So that'll kind of take the edge off, but still, that achievement is chapter one of <laughs> Seriously 5.0. <laughs> what on earth? I mean, I know they've got some post-launch support plan with, like, new escape maps, new escape characters, uh, letting you build horde maps and versus maps in the builder mode, not just escape maps, but still, like, <laughs> crazy. But the amount of content that they're packing into this thing is absurd, and I love it. I really Yeah, absolutely, do. and they, like... It's crazy because they've, the coalition has shown us a ton of stuff, but there's still a ton of stuff they need to show. And right. I think that really speaks volumes for how much they're packing into this game. Um, and that right, really speaks right. to a wider audience of people than it ever has with its variety of game modes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's something for everybody. I, I My brothers have never really taken to competitive Gears multiplayer because it's just wasn't for them the nasher wall bouncing didn't agree with them but they like arcade they were actually mm. able to have fun in arcade and so it's like that's cool that's really cool i'm glad that they're going the extra mile and providing something for everyone uh so what do we think we're going to see at gamescom because we got to keep in mind this wasn't originally planned something changed originally they were actually going to hold off and do the story launch trailer in september just before the game released mm -hmm. so I, th I think part of what plays into this decision is obviously fan feedback because I, there was not a single Gears fan I know that wasn't a little disappointed that we didn't see more of the campaign at E3. Oh, yeah. Even the most positive, even even the most positive have said, yeah, well, I didn't wait. Come on. Yeah. So I think uh, fan feedback because they said they were going to show off uh, Horde add an inside Xbox at a later date, which of course would be the Gamescom inside Xbox, mm -hmm. which, which only makes sense. Um, but to add campaign, I, I truly believe that was fan feedback that drove that decision. It, it absolutely was. It was absolutely them seeing, okay, people really are what, what you can disagree or agree that, or argue or whatever that they should have been complaining or not. But the point is people were even the exactly. most hardcore were saying, Hey, we really want to see a little more than just what we saw at E3 2018. Can you give us something else? So I think I think if they do a four minute story trailer here, that's enough. It's like okay, calm down. It's like here's a here's a new peek at what we've got. Here's some of the story beats. Here's a little bit more of the gameplay. I feel like that's enough. I do I disagree with people who say, well, you need a nice long gameplay demo because it's like. Even if they do new set pieces or new mechanics, it's Gears. You understand how it plays. There's no reason to give that away. There's no reason to just do that for the sake of doing that. Instead, focus on the story beats. Give it like an emotional story trailer. I uh, See, I agree with you here because I think a, five, a four or five minute uh, story trailer kind of gives set a more of a tone of what's going. We kind of have a tone of what we're what we're getting into with Gears 5 mm -hmm. from the 2018 trailer, but give people a little bit more. And then they're really going to have mm -hmm. to focus on Horde because Horde is the big question mark for a lot of people is because there was a lot of complaints with Gears 4 about how Horde was handled. And now Rod Ferguson has come out and said that they have changed a lot and taken fan feedback majorly into uh, consideration in what they've tweaked in Horde. But we have yet to see what that translates to. 
So I think yeah, the, yeah, for sure, for sure. So I think they're going to have to spend a fair amount of time explaining the changes to Horde, things like eliminating the card system, things like things like that. There's a lot. Of th- there's a lot of things that was in Gears Four Horde that a lot of people didn't take to. So I think in order to truly get Gears fans fully on board, a five minute story trailer would do enough to calm the nerves of some people. And I think focusing on Horde will be a good uh, finish, so to speak. And just highlighting, okay, this is what we did in Gears 4. We get that people didn't like this, so we changed it, and this is what it looks like now. Right, exactly. And and I do expect them to go kind of in-depth on that. Good call for that to be the focus of the Inside Xbox episode at Gamescom, and then do the story trailer on Jeff Keighley's show. Good call. Good call. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We have just a little bit more Gears 5 uh, news as well, because... It took them long enough, but we finally have a game big enough that we got a custom Xbox One X. Right. <laughs> and like, I like, no, I wasn't one of these people that was like, where's the custom Xbox One X for Crackdown 3? Let's be real, people. <laughs> Let's be real. Okay. Whoa, edition. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I just want Terry Cruz's face across the front of my Xbox One X. To be fair, that people would have bought that. Like I yeah, I know. That. Yeah, I know. Uh, so they've gotten really all out uh, with the Gears 5 hardware. So in a list of things that you can get in really awesome custom, we're going to start with the Gears 5 Xbox One X limited edition bundle, mm-hmm. which is just probably one of the most beautiful custom Xboxes they've done this generation beside the Xbox one S they did for gears four. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It seems like, it seems like that they really go above and beyond for their custom consoles. Xbox doesn't do them often. Let's be honest. They, they've done them way less this generation than they did for the generation before. But when they do them, they do them right. And I have to say, with Halo Infinite coming out next year, let's be real, Gears 5 was probably the last chance to do a big, widespread custom Xbox One X. If we're being Absolutely. honest, this, this was kind of the last game that they could do it for. Gears Tactics, Ninja Theory, they aren't quite big enough. I love Ori to death, but I don't think that's widespread enough to justify it. I would love to be wrong. I would love to be wrong on that, uh, but I don't think it quite justifies it. In Halo Infinite, if you're going to do a custom one, you're going to do a custom Scarlet, since it's Absolutely. launching a long Scarlet. So th- this was the last opportunity, and they nailed it. They they knocked it out of the park. The laser-etched cracks, so it looks like the Cog Omen is floating underneath the ice. They've really got an ice theme going on. Like Kate with ice and like JD or the swarm with fire. It's difficult to tell. Um, but the, they've got an interesting duality going on there. The locust symbol is on the bottom of the console. Looks really good. Comes with the new controller as well. Mm-hmm. The custom uh, Kate controller, which looks nice. Yeah, it, it's worth a grabbing. I'm getting it, personally. I'm getting it. It is my, it is my shameless indulgence purchase for this generation. Because I missed out on the Gears of War 4S. I didn't even get an Xbox One S. I'm not one of these people who got an S and then upgrade to an X. So this is this is my indulgence, so to speak. And I'm going to enjoy grabbing that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it comes with, I was going to say, it comes with Gears 5 Ultimate Edition, full game download. Uh, it's got Gears of War uh, Ultimate Edition, Gears of War 2, 3, and Gears of War 4. Oh, good. Uh, so I can give you the codes for those first four games. Since you don't have those, then. <laughs> yeah, actually, the only one I'm missing now is three. Oh, well, I'll give you that one, then. That Beautiful. Um, uh, you got one month of Xbox Game Pass and Xbox Live Gold. Uh, you get uh, special skins. Um, yeah, it's it's a great-looking bundle. And on top of this, you can buy the controller separately for those that already have an X like myself, and you're like... <sighs> Can't really justify trading it in and then spending another couple hundred bucks to get it. Um, there's also a custom Razer turret as well, which is the mouse and keyboard combo, uh, which released a few months back for Xbox consoles. Uh, there is also, I believe, there's the hard drive as well. And yep. I believe, yeah, there's also a headset as well. Yeah, there's a headset. They, they haven't revealed pricing details on the headset. That's no. going to be 
uh, available. Like they, I guess they're going to talk about that closer to launch, but they haven't. That one's not up for pre-order yet. I don't think the Razor turret is either. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, do, I don't think the yeah. turret's up for pre-order. The Razor stuff doesn't have dates or uh, doesn't have uh, prices yet. But okay. it's safe to say the Razor turret will probably go for around the same price as the regular Razor turret and uh, the Razor Thresher, which is the one that's getting the headset typically goes for uh around depending on which version they decide to customize it usually goes for anywhere from 150 to 200 dollars okay yeah i I can't quite justify getting those unfortunately i'll get the console though can't quite justify that like the thing is for me as much as i would love to the keyboard and mouse just it's not quite there like there's a good chunk of games that use it but we're not there 100 percent yet on Xbox. And so as a result, I just I just can't justify it. Uh well, actually, sorry. There according to the official Xbox press release, the keyboard and mouse does have a price point and it retails for 2.99, which is a yeah, little just, rich for me. It's um, a little rich for me too. I can't I can't do that. Can't do that. Um but I will I, get I, the hard drive because I I need another external hard drive to because this one is like it's getting dangerously low thanks to Game Pass, <laughs> which I never thought would happen, but it's happening. See, I've and, got two and we've got like another year to go. So I'm like, yeah, I, I need another five terabyte. See, I, I, I was looking for the ultimate irony is the fact that I have two Seagate hard drives uh, already for my Xbox One X. I was kind of sitting there going, I do need a hard drive for my PlayStation, though. <laughs> I was like, can I justify this? <laughs> um, it's pretty cool, too. If you go to GameStop, you can get a five terabyte version of the hard drive as well. Um, if you absolutely need an insane amount of space, um, you also get a one ma- one month Xbox Game Pass Ultimate membership and a Lancer Weapon skin and supply drops for Gears 5 as well included. So tons of great gear stuff. They're really going all out with this. Um, and it's just great to see. Uh, it's great to see Microsoft basically throwing themselves into the marketing of a game like this because it, it feels like it's been a while. Um, since they've thrown it's been it. a long time. It's been a really, really, really long time since they went this hard on like a bunch of different hardware. I know there's the meme about Microsoft controllers, but you know, moving aside the different controller variants, when we talk about across everything, it's been a long time since they pushed this hard, since they went this hard to like, yeah, we just engineered up something crazy. And I enjoy that. I really enjoy that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's great to see this level of marketing and everything else. And hopefully the game does exceptionally well. I don't see a world where it doesn't at this point. Um, fans are excited. Uh, social media is pumping people that aren't even huge gears. Fans are kind of paying attention. So it's a, it really speaks volumes to what the coalitions managed to do with an IP that they're, I'm going to say relatively fresh with still. Well, of course it's Tom Rod Ferguson, who's worked on it forever and everything else, but still, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how Gears Five pans out, and we only have to wait less than a month now. Yep, yep, not too long, not too long now, not too long until it's in our hands. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna touch on this briefly. Um, Twitch is a little bit of a disaster right now. Oh boy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, and the only reason we're going to talk about this is because Mixer is kind of blown up because of the aftermath of it all. Now, of course, I could toss this over to Sam because he wrote a very encompassing article, which is linked in the description, about what people are mad about. So <laughs> the trending hashtag right now, I believe Sam will correct me if I'm wrong, is the Twitch party is over hashtag. Yeah, that, that's the hashtag that went nuts. It, it, it's probably no longer trending by the time you're listening to this. I, but I hope not, at least. It, it, I hope not, geez. <laughs> but it, it was trending. It was trending. And the nutshell version is, agree with them or not, a lot of people are just tired of what Twitch has been doing and what they perceive are the moderation issues. They, According to some people, they Twitch isn't moderating evenly. It's showing, uh, like, uh, how do I put this unequal hands to different mm-hmm. streamers based off of how much money they're making off of said streamers, like the whole doctor disrespect situation where he got reinstated a week after he was banned from E3 and banned from Twitch for live streaming himself 
using the bathroom at E3, mm-hmm. you know, um, which is fantastic. But just a week later, he's back on. And to be fair, I don't think anyone real thought that he was going to be banned permanently. I don't think anyone thought that. But just a week Mm, would a smaller streamer just be banned for a week? And you can say, well, that's the name of the game, but Twitch has said that they're sub- going to be moderating evenly, but then they're not making statements on this kind of stuff. Or streamers, there have been situations with animal abuse or where slurred words or intentional slurs, racial slurs were used, and it people are interpreting it as something really ugly being said. And so... It's like, regardless of whether it was an accident or not, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. The fact is, Twitch isn't commenting on it. It's not like Twitch is even bothering to say, hey, yeah, we checked in on this, everything is all good, or hey, yeah, uh, no, this isn't cool, we're going to be suspending this person for so long while they think about what they did. There's just nothing. Meanwhile, over on the Mixer side of things, Mixer's rules are fairly well enforced. Now, I'm not a Mixer aficionado. But I will say that everything I've seen from different streamers who are on there, they all say, yeah, our communities are great. It's not toxic at all. There's no issues. We barely even have to have our mods. Make of that what you will. But it's interesting to see. And with Ninja leaving, Tyler Blevins is his name, I believe, uh, leaving for Mixer, signing that deal with Microsoft and Twitch losing one of their bigger streamers. It's certainly interesting to see if more and more people are driven away from Twitch, Amazon and Twitch could have a real problem on their hands. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. The the most interesting part of this for me has been watching Twitch's responses and how they've handled um, certain aspects of this Um, from it was brought to my attention via DMs. One of the co co co-owners of Twitch actually co the quote tweeted uh, Ninja's tweet of him switching to Mixer and put rest in peace with a winky face. To be fair, I don't think he's been at uh, Twitch for some time. No, no, yeah, but still, but still a little, still a little. Eh, OK, S- still, right. uh, still, st- still when whether he's with the company or not, it's not a good thing when people are roasting your platform or a platform you helped to create. And the, the thing that blows me away about this is, like, if you go to any PAX event, any PAX event or any gaming event in general, Twitch is at the front forefront of diversity and giving people platforms to speak and everything else. They're all about treating people fairly and everything else. But when it comes to moderating their own platform, they couldn't be any more polar opposite. Mm-hmm. And it's not good when people can start playing connect the dots it's one thing if one streamer kind of screws up and you leave them unpunished then like six months later another streamer does something and it goes unpunished it's harder people are more keen to forget Mm -hmm. but when all of this has transpired in what three months yeah basically it's all happening it like eh. It's just it, it, it creates an impression. You know, people are starting to see a pattern, right or wrong. And the thing is, right or wrong, Twitch isn't talking about it. Twitch isn't at least trying to have a discussion. Yeah, because like they made a really small uh, statement in regards to Dr. Disrespect uh, when they banned him, stating that they had banned him indefinitely. And then mm-hmm. he came back a week later and they gave him a feature on the front page for his week, return stream. A week is not indefinite. If anything, that week gave him more appeal than anything because mm-hmm. it was like people missed him for a week. It wasn't like people missed him for a month or three months and it actually had the time to damage his brand or anything. He benefited from that more than anything at this point, I would argue. I, I would argue, too, that if you're going to punish a streamer when they do their first stream back, do not give them front page space. Mm-hmm. He was the featured streamer the, for the day on Twitch's front page when he did his return stream. So he absolutely did not get any punishment at all. It was more of a pat on the back of go sit in the corner for a minute. We'll sort it out. Don't worry about it. And yep. then when they were reached for comment about featuring him on the front page on his return stream, they had no comment to say. And it's the same thing with Alinity, with the animal abuse and everything else. No comment on that. 
no mm-hmm. comment on racial slurs. No, it's just in a in a in a social media space where people are driven by outrage. You need to respond. Exactly. It doesn't matter whether your opinion is these people did something wrong or no, they're innocent. They didn't say that. They didn't do whatever. It's like Twitch needs to be talking about it. Right or wrong, Twitch needs to say, hey, we did our due diligence because otherwise people are going to assume and rightfully assume, I will add here in parentheses, that you're just not interested in moderating your big streamers. That's the message that people are getting. That's the message that we're seeing people say is the reason, the primary reason that they're moving over to Mixer. Because Mixer, by all accounts so far, this could change in the future, by all accounts so far, Mixer is great at moderating. Even if that means their rules are like a tire are a little more stringent than Twitch at the moment, which I've heard is a legitimate complaint uh, from some uh, female streamers. So maybe that's something they need to look into. But overall, I hear far less, basically no complaints about moderation on Twitch. At this point, the what could, the only thing that could make Mixer a bigger win right now is if they got a big Twitch streamer to transition over who then goes off kilter and says something against their terms of services and then mixer bans them that's Mm -hmm. the only way this could get even better for mixer because if they can go see this person's huge and we ban them exactly exactly show that you are interested we're building we meet it and if you want to stream this kind of content then you have that opportunity under like the 18 up section if you want to stream this kind of content you don't you do it family friendly like, yep. I don't know, that seems, until further notice and I am proven wrong, it seems pretty basic to me that that's how it works. So, yeah, it, it's, it is what it is at this point. And Twitch doesn't seem interested in finding um, finding a solution to it until they start hemorrhaging money from it. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. think they're going to start hemorrhaging money quickly, but it, all it'll take is a few major advertisers to pull out. Let's face it, YouTube had horrible moderation for a long time, and then all of a sudden we got ad ad partners pulling out, and then the ad ad apocalypse happened to content creators because YouTube was losing uh, ad ad ads because of content that they allowed on their site. So they had to start demonetizing channels. I would point out that the main difference, though, is that YouTube still doesn't have a competitor when it comes to videos. There's nothing. There's nothing else. Everything is a YouTube channel. It's this brand's YouTube channel. It's that brand's YouTube channel. There's no other video service that even remotely registers as a blip on the map by comparison. On the contrary here, Mixer is smaller, much smaller than Twitch. No question. But it is alive and it is growing and it is a competitor. That's the difference. Yep. Twitch can't just pull a Google and a YouTube and say, well, must suck to be you, but we get the final say because you have no alternative. There is an alternative here. And it seems like people are taking it. Absolutely. And a ton, a ton of Mixer streamers have been very open about saying, yeah, come on down. Enjoy the fun. And... Enjoy yourself. Uh, even Ninja's been stream stream rating po- uh, mid to small uh, mixer channels and been blowing up sub channels astronomically with his audience. That's all. And it's awesome. That's that's cool. And it's just it's great to see. And like Mixer's gonna have growing pains. I, I think people don't seem to realize this is one of the reasons why Mixer is so great is because it's small. It's easy to oh, moderate. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yes. They're, they're going to have some growing pains, but how they handle those growing pains is what's going to define them as a company. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because what people don't remember with Twitch is Twitch was originally created so people had freedom to make the content they wanted to and live stream and everything else in an open and safe environment. That was the purpose of Twitch. Like everyone's dragged out that original tweet from the official Twitch account is they want to be held accountable for their terms of services because it's their code of conduct. And it, the it last has... thing I'll say about this is Twitch. People are calling you on it. Are you going to listen or not? Yep. When you've got websites churning out two articles a day about this, it starts to damage your brand. And we have big, it's one thing when mixer, paid 
to have ninja transition but when you get big streamers transitioning just because that's mm -hmm. not a good sign or just dipping their toe in the water. Or I've seen a bunch of people who have never even touched a mixer before. Once they find out about doing dual streams, they're like, hey, I'm, all right, let's experiment over and see what's going on. It's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. It'll be interesting to see how esports shapes around in everything. Because like, as you said, with like the co-streaming and everything else, that could be huge for esports and everything else. It'll be really interesting to see uh, to see how that's implemented. Um, so yeah, we're going to move right along. We've got a good discussion topic to talk about, but just a little bit of thing. We're going to cover this more in depth on gaming perspective. Um, but a little bit of Xbox game pass news. So for people that don't know, there's an interview done with Mike Rose from no more robots, which is an independent, independent indie developer who has published such games as not tonight descenders and hypno space outlaw. Now, the big key point of this is Mike Rose was probably one of the most um, openly against Xbox Game Pass when it was announced. He was like, well, it doesn't make sense. It might be bad for developers long term. And he made some really good points early on to Xbox Game Pass of could this harm the industry? Uh, and in this in this interview, uh, he's talked about how Descenders, which is their most recent game, um, really benefited from Xbox Game Pass because of the marketing that comes with Xbox Game Pass and uh, how how basically how helpful the Xbox team was in, oh, you can we use your game as a, a banner ad on the store? Can we use your game in a Game Pass advertisement? Can we use, and as he said, it translated to an impressive boost in numbers for the title and it ended up, Descenders ended up doing originally out the door quadrupled what they thought it was going to do numbers wise on Xbox and then settled about three times as much as they had projected prior, um, which kind of at this point, can we just lay to rest the whole uh, Xbox Game Pass is going to make the industry implode? Uh, rumors. Yeah, seriously. Like, I, I understand when it was new that people legitimately had some concerns. So, OK. I, like I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt at this point, if you actually say that you're just trolling because it's the, the evidence is clear as day here. doesn't mean there won't be occasional issues here or there, but by and large, Matt Piscatella NPD analyst has been saying since sea of thieves since well over a year ago. Yeah, no game pass is helping. It might help a little bit. It might help a lot. That depends on other factors. It's not an automatic win formula. That's not the case here, but it's a good boost at minimum. It provides more opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's. I'll I'll just say this. Everyone knows I'm an I I I like Xbox as an ecosystem. It's one of my favorite ecosystems that I'm a part of. I have tons of friends in the Xbox space. I know a handful of people that work at Xbox and everything else, but. If Xbox Game Pass can make a more casual audience realize that there's really great small games out there like Descenders, then awesome. Because in an overtly saturated independent games market, like if you go on Steam on any given day and go into the indie section, good lord, you've got to sift through a lot of cash grabby, reskin nonsense to find a handful of good games mm -hmm. so if if game pass can continue this trend of keeping the best best indie games in there and promoting them then i am all for it and if the developers can find success and it is sustainable then absolutely awesome we're going to talk about this more in depth on gaming perspective but it felt relevant to talk about since we're recording this on monday and this news broke today yeah. um it's just really cool to see someone who is critical of it say this works. And if they keep improving on certain aspects of it, it can be even better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how it is, how it's going to be going forward. Um, and if Microsoft has to change one developer at a time, that's what they got to do. If they yeah, got to change people's sure. minds one at a time, then they've got to do it one at a time. We've seen them with acquiring studios that have been doing it the same way changing minds one one studio at a time yep 
So speaking of Xbox Studios, so the Game Informer show, which is a podcast pawned by, of course, uh, Game Informer, um, did a very interesting interview with uh, Matt Booty recently. Um, and he talked on a wide range of subjects that got divided into like 30 articles across every site. Every quote you've heard about Xbox Game Studios in the past week has come from a short interview. Of so, course. <laughs> of course. How else? Um, a lot of the key talking points, however, was flexibility within Xbox Game Studios. And of course, everyone's talking about Outer Worlds because all of a sudden Outer Worlds is on everyone's game on everyone's map now. This went from a game that people were mm -hmm. kind of tempted about to, uh, as you mentioned him earlier, Matt Piscatella said, I may have made a mistake not putting Outer Worlds in the top five games of this year. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's really interesting. So Matt had some interesting things to say in regards to what's going on with the Outer Worlds IP, because there's been a lot of confusion about, well, what's going to go on with the sequel? Because... Private Division technically has the publishing rights for the Outer Worlds, uh, but Microsoft owns the IP, so does that mean it's going to be a multi-plat game going forward, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, but the big takeaway from this is that, so the question posed to Matt was, so something like for Outer Worlds, I imagine you're playing Outer Worlds 2 being like a big Microsoft exclusive movie in the future as well then. Yeah, I'd like to think that'd be the kind of game you know from what you've seen of Outer Worlds. My hope is that something we can build and it really becomes an enduring franchise. It really starts to grow and we can expand on that. Um, and he compares it to uh, says in terms of setting a universe up in terms of like Halo, how it can it can support novels, fiction, comic books. So to me, like we're going to skip past the exclusivity talk because everyone's going to talk about, well, is the sequel going to be exclusive? I really don't care about that. What I'm really interested in about this conversation is that Microsoft is looking at these original IPs and going, we want to make a franchise out of this. We really believe in what this developer is doing. Do you really think that right. Outer Worlds could become a big Xbox staple franchise? I think it could. Like, okay, if you're asking me if, if Outer Worlds can be the next Halo, no. Okay, yeah. I, but to be fair, I think the list of things that can do that are bordering on non-existent and are limited to potentially whatever the initiative is working on slash playgrounds rpg <laughs> fable <clears throat> um that, that so that list is pretty short okay in terms of you know in terms of the game that has like two thousand people working on it you know across external and internal divisions and has a crazy budget and all that but if you're asking me if i think it's going to be one of their staple series yes 100 percent for the longest time now bethesda has needed you know a good a good kick in the butt so to speak, I love them, but they've needed a kick in the butt when it comes to Fallout, when it comes to Bethesda Game Studios games and seeing Obsidian do something like this, a, an admittedly in between double A AA to triple A RPG. They're not aiming for the craziest graphics in the world, you know, aiming for like a 25 to 35 hour RPG. That's great. That's perfect. That sounds appealing to a lot of people. And I think it's going to get a great reception. Previews have been universally positive. Across the board, uh, our own uh, Carly Veloci at uh, Windows Central, she loved it at a recent event that she went to. Other previews have all been very positive, and I think they have a hit on their hands. I really do. I think this is one of those series that moving forward, like Outer Worlds 2, that's going to be a big announcement. That's going to be a big Xbox event at E3 2022 or whenever. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Like. The thing is, is like Outer Worlds, it it people don't understand. Like for me, the Outer Worlds is going to be huge for me because I was one of these people when Obsidian was purchased. I was like, people have been wanting Xbox to make great RPGs. They bought one of the best RPG studios mm -hmm. right there. And people were like, oh, well, not really. They've only ever done stuff with other people's IPs. That has been hugely like, yeah, successful. Yeah, that's the only thing they've ever had the opportunity to. Bingo. And the thing is, is like, and like we've seen the sentiment across uh, Reset Era and other forums as well, is, well, if the Our Worlds 2 is multi-platform, then why would Microsoft buy the studio? 
because the well, studio was floundering and was kickstarting games and barely scraping by. So they <laughs> funded these studios to make this game, this like Outer Worlds. I'm not going to say to the scale it is. I'm not going to pretend like Obsidian didn't already have this in the works, obviously. And it was already like three quarters of the way done when they got bought. But the budget for the sequel to this game is going to be massive and what obsidian managed to do on the budget they had looks phenomenal so far this is the closest looking thing to a fallout game i've seen since new vegas well that's the thing that's what i was saying in the beginning of my spiel there is bethesda hasn't had any competition that's the thing they've been the only ones doing their thing now finally they're going to have competition they're going to have encouragement to improve things change things up further and I like that. Competition breeds innovation. It'll be good for the industry. It'll be good for Obsidian. And it'll be good for Bethesda. And it'll be good for Microsoft. Absolutely. And let's face it, this generation in terms of Western RPGs has kind of uh, kind of been lacking. Uh, we, get, we had Witcher 3, which was the glorious salvation of mankind. Well, I, but I, I, will, I will battle this because I personally separate uh, like CD Projekt Red and I'll even throw like War Horse Studio. I, te- I, like, I know technically they're quote unquote Western RPGs, but I don't know. I feel like we almost have to class that European section of developers into their own genre at this point. They, they, they do have they do have an Eastern European feel. I, I do. OK, Witcher 3 has it far less than like War Horse's game. Uh, Kingdom yeah. Come Deliverance says Witcher 3. It's like it's very mild. But I do understand what you mean by like that Eastern European feel. Um, some have mistakenly called it like Eurojack affectionately in parody, like uh, the games that yeah. Spiders makes, like the upcoming Greedfall, Elex from uh, Piranha Bytes, things like that. They do have that feel. Witcher 3 only has it a tiny bit. But I know what you mean in terms of Eastern European design influence. I would counter to you that it's still a Western RPG and follows Western RPG design uh, conventions far more than it does, like, Japanese RPG. Yeah, no, no, that, 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 touche on that. We'll agree to disagree on that one. But, like, when you think about, like, Bioware's only RPG addition to this generation was Mass Effect Andromeda, which we can't. Well, can we count Inquisition? Can we count Dragon Age Inquisition or because that came out on 360 and PS3 as well? Does it not count? But the DLC was new consoles only. We'll classify because didn't that win Game of the Year 2014? It won Game of the Year 2014, and I know I know it had a 360 PS3 version, but Bioware has freely admitted that those versions were a mistake, and they didn't make the DLC for them as a result. They just focused on making the DLC for the new console. So I think we can classify that. Yeah, so so we got... We got the thing is, is though, if you, you look at the amount of Western RPGs that have come out that have been huge successes versus the amount of JRPGs that have come out this gen, uh, generation to massive success it's a very different scale than it was say in the xbox 360 ps3 oh, absolutely absolutely the 360 gen uh jrpgs floundered by comparison mm-hmm. they, they didn't get or floundered might be the wrong word they didn't have the same critical and commercial success not by half i'm sorry no one knew what near was Back in the 360. Okay, <laughs> nobody. Basically nobody. If you actually are one of the people who did, then congratulations to you. But you'll forgive my skepticism. Nobody bought that. Near Automata, on the other hand, has been a phenomenal success. Final Fantasy 13 did do very well, but it's a Final Fantasy game. That's the most mainline JRPG there is in all of <laughs> mainline JRPGs, you know. Uh, Final Fantasy 15 has done really well. It's a shame about what happened with the second DLC pass. Yeah, by comparison... If we count Witcher 3, give me that one. We had Witcher 3. We had Dragon Age Inquisition. We had Mass Effect Andromeda. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, know there have technically been others, but I'm drawing a blank. In terms yeah, of and, then when you compare, when, and then when you compare it to the list of JRPGs, like you've got Nier Automata, you've got... Uh, uh, Nino Kune 2 found big success. Persona 5 is the biggest success that the Persona series has seen. Final Fantasy 15, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, now Fire Emblem, Three yep. Houses, which has set the world on fire, pun intended, because it's the biggest this franchise has ever been. It's insane how much it's blown up. JRPGs are doing hot right now. JRPGs, 
it, it never seems like Western RPGs and JRPGs can thrive at the same time. Yeah. Um, well, 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 Cyberpunk comes out next year. So maybe well, we'll Baldur's Gate it. 2 comes out in September 24th, so console people will finally get to experience greatness. <laughs> um, yeah, don't worry. It's not just gaming perspective where I'll talk about Baldur's Gate. I'll sneak it into every podcast I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> we can't escape it. No, it, it, it's true. But I think Outer Worlds is going to be great. I think that it's going to be a huge thing for Obsidian. And I just really w- wish uh, Obsidian the best because they they they're highly underrated because the thing is, is, yes, they typically handled other people's IPs. But damn it, if Fallout New Vegas isn't the, one of the best Fallout games and if they did not knock uh, South Park, the stick of truth out of the park, um, mm-hmm. it's just absolutely ha- it's just absolutely massive now there's another part of this uh uh matt booty interview that people are talking about is uh there's certain parts that people have skipped over um basically that all these studios that they've purchased have something uh have clauses to allow for basically a divorce not that they plan to at least it basically uh if they want to leave the Xbox Game Studios family, they can. They retain their ownership of IPs, those kind of things. So developer freedom appears to be the big motive here. And like my Xbox themselves has said, Phil Spencer's reiterated it. Everyone on that team's reiterated it. It's all about giving the developers the support and leaving the studios as they found them. Yeah, or or at least in a better position, ideally, exactly. than they found them. And I, I appreciate that. I don't think that there's anything big to worry about there i wouldn't re- fear mongering i wouldn't read into anything here but this is just them saying hey worst case scenario if Absolutely. things really aren't working out if it's just become clear here this is a disaster this isn't working out for us we want to give them that chance to okay you can go back to being independent give that another shot then if you like that instead um i don't think it, frankly that it's going to come to that for any of them all of them I've, I've talked to developers from basically every studio that Microsoft and they all preach the same thing. That is, no, we love it. This has been fantastic. They haven't changed us a bit. It's just better resources and more friendly faces. So I don't mm. think there's anything to worry about there, but it's still a good thing to do. Still a good thing to do by far. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one, one of the key, one of the uh, things that we can finally lay to rest because it's on paper now is this whole nonsense about Forza, Halo, Sea of Thieves, and Microsoft-owned IPs going to PlayStation. Because he specifically yeah, no, it's said, not but then we're obviously going to have our big franchises like Forza, Halo, and Sea of Thieves, and others, where those games are designed from the outset to really exist on Xbox, and that will continue. And that's so, the key word of what he said here. It's not oh, well, this game existed before we brought it in. It wouldn't really be nice of us to pull it from other platforms. That's them being nice. And in some cases, you know, like legal issues with backers who have a legal right to get the version. Like people who backed Wasteland 3 and they said want a PS4 copy. They're going to provide that, even though they're taking over the publishing rights. But games that they're designing from the ground up, you know, Playground's next RPG, whatever the initial initiative is working on whatever the coalition does that comes after gears five anything like that double finds next big game after psychonauts 2 those are going to be xbox platform games absolutely and it even speaks volumes uh GameSpot did an excellent uh piece on phil spencer uh today uh yes go read it yes. it was really fantastic great article. fantastic article um he t- t- talk, talks about Phil Spencer, and uh, one of the quotes from it was when Microsoft bought uh, Mojang and Minecraft. One of the first calls they got, uh, Phil Spencer got after Minecraft acquisition was from Sony saying, are you going to pull it off PlayStation? And Phil Spencer's response was like, why would I do that? People like playing it on PlayStation. Yeah, they're not going to pull stuff that they buy that currently exists or was about to exist on playstation they're not going to do that but the new franchises xbox fans should be excited because there's going to be tons of new content i would argue i would argue to you nick that xbox game studios microsoft studios whatever you want to call it has never been in a better position than before no absolutely before now They, they have never they've had some studios come they've had some go they have never been in this 
kind of quality position where they have 15 studios that are going to be producing different kinds of games and different kinds of content and things like that. And that's before next gen is here, 15, and we could still hit higher numbers than that <laughs> before next gen arrives. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's been really great to see how Xbox has progressed from a company that at the end of the 360 generation relied heavily on third party companies making their first party games. Yeah, exactly. To learning from that mistake to now course directing. And in my opinion, they're, they're set for a bright future. Um, they are. The future is exciting. I, if you're an Xbox fan, never been a better time to be excited than now. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, that kind of wraps up that talk. I want to talk. I want to talk about that interview because there's some stuff that people. You know, the biggest problem I find with interviews is they get piecemeal to such a point. People take one sentence out of a paragraph statement and then use it to spin it the way they want it to sound. Yeah, instead of actually looking at the interview as a whole. There's a lot of other good stuff in that interview that we didn't even get to talk about, by the yeah, way. Yeah, so absolutely. Check it out. I, absolutely it. I absolutely encourage people to listen to things like the Game Informer show when they do interviews like this or uh, IGN's Unfiltered or things like that. There, You learn a lot more if you listen to the interview in its entirety instead of just piecemealed. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll link that full interview in the description. If you guys want to, after you finish listening to this, you want to go listen to that. Um, it's a really great interview and it's great to see Microsoft slowly, but surely learning the transparency of PR talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> taking them to, long enough, but they're getting it. Yeah, they're getting there. They're getting there. So, uh, we'll do a quick wrap up here. Um, so Sam, if people want to find this, uh, content you work on, where could they find it? You can find it at three of mobile nations, different sites. You can find anything Nintendo related. I write on iMore. You can find PlayStation related stuff on Android central, and you can find Xbox or PC related stuff on windows central. I've got a couple of really big pieces coming to windows central very soon. They actually, God willing, they should be out by the time you're listening to this. Uh, we'll see. Depends on how crazy the news is. Absolutely. And of course, I'm Nicholas Downey. You can find me on Twitter at Undead3XVI and any of my written work at TickGamesNetwork.com. Uh, got a couple interesting reviews that I'm uh, trying to put the foot polishing touches on and got some more stuff coming this week. Um, got some uh, a piece on the ESA and their E3 leak and their complete lack of, uh, I'm going to say, empathy or care. And I've got a piece about video game violence, which will be another uh, real head-scratcher, <laughs> oh, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for those. I hope you guys enjoyed the first episode of the Xbox Perspective. Don't forget, you can support this show and the Game Perspective show on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash gaming perspective. If you want to get these episodes as well as PlayStation Perspective early or the Gaming Perspective early, there are specific tiers geared for your specific tastes. So I encourage you guys, if you like the content that we make, to go and check that out. I appreciate all the support we get. I appreciate our MP3 listening audience as well as our, our YouTube audience as well. We'll see you guys next week as this podcast will air every Wednesday at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube and Podbean. Thank you guys for your time. As always, thanks, Sam, for joining me. And we will see you next week. <laughs>